about 90% of my time um, that's not devoted to the family and other things are spent really trying to get myself ready and to be a good storyteller, but in a structural way so that you kind of match up. So my ultimate dream is to have uh, the kind of success someday in the film and TV space that I've had in uh, in sport. I looked that up, the 7.57 billion Texas, LA. Hello and welcome to the Money Game Podcast. My name is Dion Pouncil and I am your host. And today I have a very, very special guest, my great friend and one of my great mentors, Bernard Stewart. So Bernard, please welcome and introduce yourself to the Money School family. It's it's, it's a fun time to, to, uh, to be out about and having conversations like this. Um, the world is such an active place right now in terms of business. Um, everybody grinding it is almost scary to a level of which everybody's trying to figure things out. So I'm really happy to have an opportunity to talk to you about that. Um, a quick thing about, about me, and, and it becomes kind of interesting how I present this. Uh, I was one of the original team members of ESPN Sports Center, starting the whole thing back in uh, a time when probably most of the people in your audience have never had to answer the question life without cable. <laughs> so I have had what I would consider to be one of the most amazing opportunities. Uh, there's some people who can relate to this. I, my whole career at ESPN was um, about understanding and building brands and innovation. Uh, a lot of people uh, know a lot about ESPN. I mean, we're ubiquitous. You can't go anywhere without seeing the logo. Imagine going up, which I did in that environment, where as you grew, all the things that you represented grew and you then become part of the fabric. And that has been the most interesting thing about my career. Uh, I've had an opportunity to travel the world. Uh, most people don't realize how widespread uh, the ESPN brand is on a global basis because sport is an international language, has been for centuries. And I had a chance to be at the spearhead of that to take our brand and place it in, in, in a lot of different places, launching networks in Australia and, and being involved in China and managing and launching businesses and, and navigating our business in Japan, Brazil, Argentina, spending a lot of time in Europe. Uh, and many times I, I kind of equate myself with being kind of a, a Forrest Gump of sport in many ways, being that one person who um, got a chance to do things. And the reference to Mikey is that a lot of people are always afraid to stick up the hand and go for it. I have no idea what that gene is in my DNA. But every time somebody said, you want to run into that dark room and see what's inside, I would stick my hand up because I will say that having the opportunity to work in an environment where you have um, a very strong brand behind you, you begin to realize if you're smart, that it's not about you. It is about those numbers and those letters that you carry with you. But also they give you an opportunity to find ways of really expressing how you should be in, in relation to others and in, in terms of sport and in terms of life. And then it's um, that has been my career. That has been how I worked to try to define who I am, because if you, I grew up with ESPN, so it was like growing up with a brother or a sister or a, a cousin or whatever, and you're all sort of running through trying to figure this whole thing out, realizing that the most important piece of it was that you understood the importance of hard work and you understood the purpose of relationships. And those have served me really well. So I'm not sure that's a, a proper capsulization of my my career we'll, we'll talk about it over uh, yeah the hour. We'll, we'll, we'll unpack some yeah. stuff so so yeah definitely you know legend in the building i mean espn you can't for sure not america but like you said the world you know sports has changed the world and espn is one of the driving and leading forces of that so you talk you know about a lot of things you talked about relationships you talked about business, you talked about growth, you talked about the development of yourself, right? So first and foremost, take us back pre-SPN and, and how you even got there? Because would you say that you're part of, you know, the founding team or founding group that put all that together? It has to be a story before you even get there, right? 
Uh, it was. I mean, I again back to the Forrest Gump thing. Um, I've had. I grew up in Alabama, um, Southern pride, roll tide. Hey. Uh, <laughs> and what that background brought me is all the things that you know about the South, about being black in the South and growing up in the sixties, all those things are there. Um, but the other part of it is that there's a certain part of relationships, um, navigating life that you have to learn. I left in high school right after I graduated in high school, I went off and was, I uh, went to Talladega College. I know it's very uh, popular right now for people to talk about historically black colleges, but I was involved in them in a time when that was it. We, that was our life, I believe, as, as minorities. That that was how we looked at life. And I felt kind of privileged to be in that mix. Um, young kid from Alabama, but at the same time, all of the people, almost all of the people who were around me, it was Talladega College, almost all of them were very six from families of successful black people who brought their, they wanted their kids to go to this one university. So it wasn't like I was put in an environment that um, was anything other than people around you had excelled. You weren't in an environment where it, you weren't expected to, to, to succeed, that people would tell you you can't be who you want to be. So I was very fortunate in coming through um, that whole phase. After that, I wound up in the military for in the Air Force for four years. Um, and then after that, it was, uh, and during the time I was in the military, I, I was actually able to finish and complete my whole college degree. And it was an interesting, again, an interesting time for me because it, I always seemed to be placed in a position where most of the people around me, back to the um, Mikey story, most of the people around me had a certain level of intimidation about where they were, the environment we were in. And I always had the opportunity to see it rather than a disadvantage, but an advantage, always looking to try to figure out, well, if I'm in this box or if I'm in this place, how can I position myself so that I can get the most out of it for me and succeed and excel? I mean, you wouldn't think you would think about that in the military, but that was how I looked at it. I mm -hmm. love computers. I've always loved computers. I've always been this big geek. And during the time I was in the military is the very early stages of, of computers and people were learning how to use computers. And so there was a whole l long group of individuals who were even responsible for our computer center and data center, who were just young kids who come through school. I had enough of a background that from my discipline of what I was doing in the military, which was a totally different day job, I would get a chance to go over and tinker and play with some of the most amazing equipment that the military had to play with. So it wasn't that particular point of success about the toys, but it was just having, again, the opportunity to realize that if I just did one step more or position myself one place uh, where others couldn't be, I had an opportunity to define my life better. I, I like to define it this way that, um, again, I, I keep saying the Mikey thing, and forgive me for saying that, but it is more like the sandbox mm -hmm. and that I look at my life and my career as finding as many empty sandboxes as I can find. Because the beauty of being in that space is that you're in that space, there's no rule books, there's no guidelines, there's much of nothing that exists in terms of your trying to figure this out. So you get a chance to be with team members, develop a, 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 a business strategy, a life strategy, where you can start figuring out what's good for you and what's good for the environment. Now, the interesting piece of that, and the reason I've had so many different places that I've, you know, I lived in Hong Kong, like I said, for 10 years. The reason I, I had an opportunity to do so many of those things was that one thing about building a successful sandbox, of being in a sandbox where you, it eventually starts to get interesting to others. And it's soon you find yourself surrounded by a lot of people who are not as adventurous as the original team that you work through with. They are more focused on these rules that have been established. And this is the way things should be. And now how can we perfect it based on that? So I always knew that the day that I ran into a rule or a, uh, a method of doing things, that I had put in place or the people with me had put in place and it was preventing me from moving forward like I wanted, I realized it was time to move on, find a new sandbox, because that meant that you now were part of a, a structure or part of a system that was working really well or a segment of a system that was working really well, but 
you know, what is it about you that makes you want growth and, and, and develop? I just found for me, it was just the freedom of being in a, a, a new and an adventurous space where there weren't a whole lot of rules. I can make up my own. Okay. So you go from college, you go to the Air Force, you start creating this life sandbox and making your own rules. So how do you go or take us from the time between Air Force to ESPN? Because I'm sure you didn't just jump from the plane to the to the camera. So. It's parachuted down right in the ESPN, right? Yeah. No, actually, the, the, that, that, that's a pretty interesting transition because uh, after I got out of the military, I had uh, my degree in um, film. Uh, and and then it was, well, what do I do? So I moved to New Haven and it was a time when I was a young guy, but I, I you know, I, I got married when I was 19. So I had a young wow. family and the idea was, OK, they had been with my wife and my kids have been with me growing. We're all grew together. So now here we are with this next step. And that next step was going to be living in New Haven, Connecticut and figuring out what life is supposed to be post-military. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a job and the job was in within the city services uh, of New Haven, Connecticut. And I also knew, though, that that wasn't where my, I really wanted to be. This was how I was going to feed my family. And so I actually started doing a lot of how do you become, you know, these stories of Spielberg and all these others who had this film desire and they just sort of went off and do as much as you can on your own. Well, I started doing independent um, projects. And in fact, one of the projects I did was a documentary called The Turtle. Most It, it found these guys who were um, in Essex, Connecticut, who were, the, uh, who were fond of history. And they had found that the first submarine was actually a wooden submarine that was done uh, and it was used in this early, early Civil War and others. And so they decided they wanted to recreate it and see if they if it actually worked. Mm -hmm. I happened to stumble across them at the very beginning of it. And so I thought, hmm, this sounds like a documentary. And so we worked as a partnership through that. Now I had no money, had no real um, uh, big structure that most people look for in documentaries these days. But we just started filming, started talking, kind of working our way through. And I was fortunate enough to get the public um, television group in Connecticut to talk to the right people. You know, when you're lucky, you you, you, you stumble across people who have similar ideas mm -hmm. and they help, actually helped me finish the production. And we actually um, uh, had it on, on television. And that was kind of cool. Uh, mm -hmm. From that, um, I got an opportunity to work at one of the local stations in New Haven. Um, and I was brought in and it was interesting. One of my strongest mentors in life was the person who brought me in. And he said, look, you know what you're doing in TV space. I'm going to teach you something that's very important. And that's the politics of broadcasting. And if you understand that, how to survive in the business side of it and in the relationship side of it, you already have the tool set that's necessary to kind of do the television piece. And he was right. And it was um, really um, what I would consider to be a very foundational part. And, you know, I, I would kind of trivialize the point that you made about my being your mentor. But, you know, I've had two or three mentors within life. And they all were the ones that had the foundation that sticks with me. And it's that time like when you're with a parent, your parents to taught you things and you're in this moment and you're about to do something. And then you hear your, your mom or your dad's voice in your head. Uh, they were the kind of mentors that their their words and their thoughts stuck. And it, and it helped me a lot. Yeah. So you pull out pull out a couple of gems you got in there. So number one. You had your support system and stuff set up. You already had, you know, your wife and kids. Um, and then as you begin to develop, you begin to bet on yourself. Right. So you say, you know what, even maybe outside of the job that I need to go and provide for my family, this is my passion and this is what I want to do. And this is what I want to start working on. So you actually start doing it. And as you said, you start doing it and, and people and things start to be attracted to you and you came across some opportunity. And then you did the documentary. So you built a relationship. You bet on yourself. You were able to work whatever deal out for you to be able to do it. And they be able to do it. Uh, and the things just worked out. And then you did something so well, because a lot of those skills become transferable, that other people or at other levels or at higher levels notice you. Right. And that opened up doors. Your gift made room for you. And you had the opportunity to be presented to you for something else. And then you bet on yourself again. You believe in yourself. 
you took that step forward and then you had a mentor that saw something in you and that was willing to, you know, put the ladder down or put their hand down and help and bring you up. And I can literally say I would not be where I am today without you, you know, uh, being my first investor way back when. I mean, it's almost almost 10 years coming up on coming up on 10 years ago. Yeah. So what was your biggest or most impactful business lesson that you learned while at ESPN that you still use in life and your other business ventures today? Um, I think the most important piece that I walk away with is something very basic, and that is the concept of barter. We have been as humans since we've been in a cave or wherever you think we came from, we have always been in the business of exchanging. And you have something that I need. I have something that you need or vice versa. You, I have something that you have something I want or wants and needs are really the way to look at this. And so we have a tendency in the business and in, in life and, and everything is, is a negotiation. Um, you know, everything from what are you going to pay for shoes or what are you going to pay for soup or what restaurants you go to and you're talking to you, your, your partner, or your mate about which one there's a, there's always this give and take. And whenever I find myself trying to make a decision about something or about to approach it, I approach it from the standpoint of, you know, making sure that if we both get what we want or we both have our, our needs serviced, then we're in a, in a good space. And it's just that basic, no matter you pick a deal and none of those deals go through and work unless one, you understand what the other person wants. And then two, you figure out a way to service that. And you have to be clear about what you want so that you can make sure that in that deal, you get service for your own, your needs as well. So kind of basic, but uh, barter is a word that always pops in my head whenever I get ready to sit down at a table. The, yeah. the other um, part of that whole idea of, win-win and to make it work is creativity. We all think that our idea is the most original and beautiful idea that has ever come down the pike. The reality is it's right. just the opposite. Billion, seven billion people on the planet, you got to realize that somebody else, it may not be your double ganger, but somebody else out there has come across this idea and somebody else right. may have made it even better. So I use the term research as being a guide point for me. You need to be able to be willing to do really strong research about whatever it is, or whatever endeavor you're about to get. Uh, I made the comment that, you know, you could find out somebody's birthmark on the Internet now because things are so robust in terms of finding out history and what other people have done. If you understand what the history has been of your concept, your idea or your path, then you put yourself in a much better position of being successful. Um, I've often used the analogy of. On a corner, there's this one corner in every city or close by you where there has been this a restaurant in this same building over and over again. And something should tell you there is something wrong with this location or something wrong with this business. Why can't you find that one successful business to be right there at that corner or right in that location? So it is really spending a lot of time trying to be thoughtful about it, doing the research. And you know what? The most unique piece, of, uh, as I think about a lot of what we've talked about about my career, sometimes it's just you. I mean, ESPN became successful mm -hmm. because of the people. People always wonder what the secret sauce was, and the secret sauce was simple. It was the people. And so I would think that if mm -hmm. you look at these uh, trial and errors. If you look at, you know, Avis and Hertz and try to figure out why is Hertz always number one and Avis is not. I mean, even if you study hard, you just can't seem to win and beat the winner. You need to just constantly be in this groove of research, always not wanting to wake up tomorrow and to find out that there was something that you missed because you were a little lazy about your homework. So those are really two things that were important. And, and, and that last one had a lot to do with my angst of just being in charge of programming and, 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 and programming scheduling. Yeah. It's like you never want to wake up in the morning and find out that there was some rights package or some availability of something that should be on your network. And somebody had a secret discussion about it or you missed the fact that somebody wanted to do a deal and you just didn't have the relationships. You didn't have your pipeline together to stay in the know about it. Harder today, 
much harder than it was when I came mm -hmm. through. But those are kind of some skill sets that I think I live by even today. Yeah. And a couple of call outs from there. I think, you know, one, everybody has ideas, but it's really about the people who can ex execute and get it done. Part of executing is researching and doing your due diligence, right? Making sure it's something that you can do or do better. Uh, location, yeah. timing, you know, you bring out the, the restaurant or the building on the corner and things like that. And un understanding product market fit or total addressable market, right? Uh, for the things that you're looking at. And that's a part of your yeah. research as well, right? Um, but then also at the end of the day, it's about people. It's about relationships, it's about connections, it's about ideas, it's about collaboration, it's about, you know, I like to say no one can do anything on this planet basically by themselves, outside of themselves. So you don't pay yourself, you don't feed yourself, you don't really clothe yourself. Like everything is done for you by somebody else. And that's what I truly believe that we're here for is to, you know, take this experience and use our experience to help the overall greater experience to help everybody and everything elevate from, you know, our part of it. So with that, tell the people what you are up to Ooh. these days, you know, since you did 30 plus years at ESPN and now what are you up to um, right now in general in life and business? Yeah. What are you up to now? These days? Well, um, interesting course, of, of, of how my path has happened since I uh, retired early from ESPN. Um, and when I first got out, I thought, you know, I have all this experience. I thought, okay, you know what, maybe I'll be just a baby Disney, a baby ESPN. And I realized the wrong idea. First of all, <laughs> your money's not long enough. <laughs> and to actually be there, it really is about, you know, all these great ideas, all these great institutions, all these great companies that we all point to, all had a point of, of, of a, it was a big bang for them. And a lot of it had to do with what was going on around them. And so for me to kind of be that new version of that was in reality kind of an impossibility because you know, most of this had been done. And for me to, to kind of do it, the, the the thing that always became, you know, back talking back to my lessons at ESPN, you learn that the barrier of entry, especially in the media business, is so high. Now, today, with the consumer technology that has happened, a lot of those things, people will argue with you over and over again, a lot of those things have been blown apart. Well, the answer is yes, but it really is for small businesses. There's only a handful of people who started in this whole idea of being in a consumer business and just blew up. And when they blew up, they blew up by getting out of the small consumer business. I mean, Issa Rae, you take with her uh, deal that she did with HBO. She started her own thing by doing her own uh, show. There's plenty of stories with all the people on TikTok and, and Instagram and YouTube who got picked up. Well, they blew up and they blew up into the, 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 the big universe. So realizing mm -hmm. that that wasn't going to happen after I spent too much money and I did the wrong thing, you're supposed to steal other people's money, not your own. Um, it, <laughs> okay. you know, it, it, it yeah. came down to the simple fact of realizing, okay, well, let's stop this here. And I think I mentioned to you my early, you asked me about my early career. Well, I had a degree in film and tape television. And I never really used it because ESPN became all consuming and the greatest thing that could ever happen to me. So when I finally got past my idea of being Mickey too, I realized maybe I should just think a moment and, and what do I really do with this? Go back to what I really thought I was going to be in the beginning. And a lot of it, that process came out to realize I was doing a lot of things to make all those big pills dream come true. It was great. Mm -hmm. And as much as I was just kind of plowing through, I was plowing through to try to do fertile ground for other people to make things better. But it was always to try to further their dream. And I just thought, okay, maybe this is something that I should learn. And that is, what is my dream? And how can I get back mm -hmm. to it? And it was a film business. And I was um, a little bit shocked at realizing I just decided to get back into film and uh, storytelling which is what I was learned. And as you mentioned about uh, the sports and ESPN, that's one of our strengths, storytellers. So I learned to be a very good storyteller. 
Uh, sport is about what life is. It's competition. It is the winning and losing day in and day out in all facets of our lives. And sport just does it very well in terms of people being able to relate to it. So I thought, okay, well, I'm a pretty good storyteller now. I know how to do that. Let me figure out how to go back into the film business and try to do that and see what, what I get from it. I had written a lot of scripts over time, you know, playing around with it. And the other thing that became really interesting was that I realized I was about to become a neophyte in a business sense in a whole new space that I didn't think I knew a lot about. But as I began to sort of investigate it, uh, trade on past relationships with people who were actually in the film business, I realized it was really a lot of it was just syntax. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you are a good business person, if you learn good business skills over time, those skills are transferable. That's the reason you find so many different people mm -hmm. doing so many different things. I give Elon Musk a, mm -hmm. a lot of credit. People are asking, why is he in so many spaces? Well, he's just as a good, he's a good administrator and he understands business. And so he could take those mm -hmm. skills and move it across. Vis-a-vis -vis the skills that I knew in business, when I started talking to people about the film business, how the film business works, um, I realized that they were using terms like waterfall and all that meant was quite simply who gets paid first and when. So that helped a lot mm -hmm. of, of relaxing my my worry about being an administrator. But I, what I really realized that, you know, this craft and skill of telling a story the way they would like you to tell it was where I needed to dig deep. And so that's what I've been spending the past three years. Um, they, uh, they, you know, they tell you, and this is where I try to dig deep and maybe obsessed with the idea of getting things right. You know, they tell you, if you're going to be a writer, if you're going to be a good writer, you should write or think about writing every day. And I would say for, out of the past three years, I've held up my end about 90% of my time. Um, that's not devoted to the family and other things are spent really trying to get myself ready and to be a good storyteller but in a structural way so that you kind of match up. So my ultimate dream is to have uh, the kind of success someday in the film and TV space that I've had in, uh, in sport. And we'll see how that, that dream uh, ends up. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. Well, if you have uh, anywhere on social media, I definitely want you to share that. But before we get out of here, I want to ask three questions, kind of like our, you know, fire. Okay. Round. So, First question is, what are your favorite three books of all time? Um, my favorite three books of all time. I will say that I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if you know the author, Mal Malcolm Gladwell, but he wrote um, Blink and he also wrote Tipping Point. Okay. I also wrote the book Outliers. And each one of those okay. I found to be very profound for me because it kind of encapsulated some of my thinking that like blink, you know, who he who blinks first loses going really deep into that, that whole bar tipping point. That means a lot of what I we we've been talking about with ESPN and how do we get to where we are? There is a certain point when things just blow up. And he talks a lot about that. And the other is outlier. And the outliers are yeah. quite simply just that people who tend to not want to be in the sandbox. And so I found that all three of those books that he wrote uh, spoke to me. There's another book that a, um, a very close friend of mine wrote, wrote called Self Made by Nellie Galan. It was on the uh, New York Times bestselling list. And what was fascinating about that book was from a female perspective, you know, we're going through a time now where we are making some serious and, and, and much needed evaluations about the male female relationship in terms of business marketplace, what we need, how we get what we want. And her self made was from the point of view of looking at women, not waiting for a Prince Charming, that they had the ability mm -hmm. to, get what they need and move forward with that. And so it wasn't, there were a few lessons that I took away from it. Um, not the least of which is that she actually gave me a nod to say that at some point along the way, I had been beneficial to helping her because what she acknowledged, which most people don't like to acknowledge is that whether you're male or female, whether you're a person of color, whether you're wherever you are or whatever circumstance you're in, it gets back to what you said you need the help of others. And so it's a book that as much as it was about self-made, it was a book that kind of gave you a recognition of the idea of, you know, you, we build all of this together, but it's on you to take the lead. And you use those tools and resources to do that. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Outliers is definitely one of my favorite books. I'll have to check out 
uh, the other three that you mentioned. Okay. The second question, if you could go back and talk to your 18 year old self and you could only say one thing, what would it be? The importance of execution. I look at, uh, I use the term roadkill <laughs> because I look at a lot of the things I've done and some things I walked away from and didn't put a proper bow on it. And those are things that I think may have hurt others. Not really hurt or damaged. It's just, I, I just wasn't gracious as I, as, as I should have been because, um, and, and I'll cite this one example that shows you my personality that I struggle with. Um, we were doing a telethon and it was live and I was the executive producer of it, producer, and I was on the floor. And one of my responsibilities were as the acts would come through and then we would go to break to clean the stage, get the acts out to move on. And I realized about halfway through the telethon that what I was doing was I was literally stopping people mid sentence. Once we went to break, I just stopped them mid sentence and go, OK, you're off. Who's on next? And I thought, <laughs> yeah, we're ready. And 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 as as I thought about it later, I I realized there was a lot of shock in the eyes of people. And it wasn't so shocked about television. It was much about the fact that I was not exactly the most skillful way of saying, okay, next. So it's um that is if I had to pick a a thing to kind of remind myself of or talk a lot about is just becoming a little bit more gracious about the idea of as of closure. As I do things, as I do projects, as I move one place to another, because, you know, this whole idea of bragging about being in my own sandbox and all the others, what happens is, is that you just shut the door and you jet off to something else. And I, I realized mm -hmm. that I, I probably should have done a better job of that. And that that's the most important because I feel very fortunate. You didn't ask me this, but what I really feel fortunate to tell that 18 year old person was you're a good person and that your core is good. But I say that because, you know, one of the books I've written is called 50, 50, a guide to a successful work life balance. And that book came from me asking the question, have I really done for the people in my family and for people that matter, have I done as good a job for them as I've done digging deep in business? And you know what? I've, I've come away realizing that, yeah, I mean, despite the fact that I said that I needed to get better at closure and all these other things, to a large extent, the people in my life, especially now and, and the way I've conducted myself, I don't think that too many people could say that I did not try to balance a little bit better their inches along with, you know, what I wanted to get done. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, and it's, it's about you talking to you. So I get it. And then the last and the third one. If you had one thing to share with anybody who's considering business or entrepreneurship or how to level up in their career or anything that was one nugget that you would share as that nugget or that inspiration, what would that be? Understanding your resources. And what I mean by that is everything that we've talked about today, all these connectivity, connective tissues and, and connectivity between it all comes down to um, resources. And, you know, it used to be a day when you could say Rolodex. And I, I still say that sometimes. It's like everybody has a Rolodex of all the people that they've collected over time. Um, and, you know, you get these lectures about nurturing relationships and keeping relationships active. I found that that to be really hard. What I found is, is as long as you've established a relationship that is meaningful, you know, there are people that you could pick up and you haven't talked to in two years and the conversation starts right where you left off. There are a lot of people that you talk to once a week and each week it sounds like a new date. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it, that would be the one thing that I would point people to is that you do have resources that when you need to have something done, and if you've been proper about sort of fertilizing for a lot of, for crappy word, uh, developing those relationships, uh, then uh, they'll come, you know, they use to keep the metaphor going. It'll spring up to be this garden of all these flowers that you can collect whenever you need to put a nice bouquet together. How about that? You like that? <laughs> yeah, for me, I kind of say I got a bunch of IOUs out oh, there. Okay. So that That's I a good way to look at it. Well, use them real 
or call back, call them, call them back, or what? Uh, you know, I can reach yeah. out because I've See, done a lot of good for a lot of people without asking for anything. Yeah, I, I, you know that last piece that you said. I was about to say I don't look at it as IOUs, but then I'm lying because I actually do just what you said. I try to do as much as I can for people. Um, and it sounds kind of creepy, but I do as much as I can because I think people need help. You want to motivate people. But all I ask is, is the day I call, come calling that you don't run. You understand yeah. that it's <laughs> remember yeah, me. Now it's time to, to help me yeah. because I need it. And I was uh, able to help you when you needed it. Back to the barter. And the yeah, room. absolutely. And I'm truly, truly, truly grateful for all the things that you've helped me with, you know, I Words of wisdom, guidance, investments, introductions, all of that. Traveling, we've been around the world together, so pretty cool stuff. Um, okay, so if you want, if people want to get in contact with you or follow you on social media or your websites or anything you'd be wanting to share uh, for us to drop in the show notes or for people to engage with you, maybe you know, talk about film projects, writing, investing, etc. I would say that um, a lot of these are pieces, but here's uh, where I would love. To get feedback from your audience if they are into storytelling it's not about sports or anything else it is a podcast uh, i've created called the storyteller and it's called feed feel it's on all the platforms you name a platform it's on it it's one story i've done right now called rebel and it is a yeah. audiobook fully produced with effects and music um i got a chance to narrate it and i i i, I I think I've done a really good job with the story, but I'd love to get the feedback of, of, of your audience and I'd love for them to listen to it. And um, without over promising, I have a Christmas story that I'm working on and it hopefully will debut around Thanksgiving, if not Thanksgiving, probably early December. It's one of the, it's a story that I, I have a, a lot of affinity to and it's called Elf Town. And every yeah. time I every time I say Elf Town, people smile, and I go, "Okay, good. At least I've got the right title to go with it." Yeah. Okay. So the first one was called Feel oh, okay. or Rebel. Yeah, I've, had, I've your confused podcast. it because if you do a search, okay. if you go on Spotify or Apple, you would. Um, it's called the Storyteller uh, and Rebel. And okay, so the Storyteller podcast and the Rebel episode or the rebel right yes the right. rebel episode okay, i made cool. it overly then, complicated and that's the only one probably good. won't have people and then with. in the next in the next 30 60 30 45 days be on the lookout for elf town yes more or less Got if it. not by christmas it may be a christmas gift it depends on uh, all the other cool. projects we're working well, on first and foremost i definitely want to say thank you bernard for you know uh blessing us with your presence here at the money game podcast i really appreciate it and always looking forward to our conversation so for the money game family thank you guys again so much for tuning in and i will see you on the next episode so as always love light peace wealth great health and abundance to each you all and i will see you on the next episode all right peace